Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Sanjeev Debi, and I will be the moderator for our presentation today. I am a FLU fellow and a member of our business transformation and innovation organization at FLU. This technical presentation is mainly for plant, electrical, and instrumentation personnel concerning a major 2020 NEC change concerning access to workspaces about electrical equipment. At FLU, safety is our number one priority. So normally we start every event with a safety topic. However, since our topic today is essentially an hour long safety in design topic unto itself, we will omit a separate safety topic. Our speakers today will be Richard Anderson and Eddie Gudry. Richard will lead the first half of the technical discussion today. Richard is a registered professional electrical engineer and a director in the electrical engineering department at FLU in the Sugarland, Texas office. He graduated 30 years ago, and something interesting about him, President George Herbert Walker Bush was the keynote speaker at his graduation. In addition to his normal job functions, he serves as a FLU Global SME and a fellow in the areas of electrical safety and codes and standards. He served on NEC Code Panel 9, which covers transformers during the last cycle, and is now a principal member of NEC Code Panel 10, covering overcurrent protection for the 2023 code cycle. Eddie will be conducting the second half of our presentation. Eddie has been in the industry for more than 40 years. Currently, he is a senior fellow in our electrical engineering department in our Sugarland, Texas office. He serves as a design lead, as well as a global SME for electrical codes, standards, and installation. He was a principal member of NEC Code Panel 11, which includes models from 1999 through 2020. For the 2023 code cycle, he has been appointed to NEC Panel 14, which covers hazardous locations. Richard and Eddie are not representing the NFPA or any NFPA committees today. The opinions and interpretations are their own and are not endorsed by the NFPA. While this presentation is meant to be informative and authoritative, always consult with the appropriate authorities having jurisdiction for final interpretations. Before we get into the presentation, a couple of housekeeping items. The audio lines for participants have been muted to eliminate any background noise. The session today is being recorded and will be stored in the United States. Please make use of the Q&A tab to ask any questions, which should be addressed to all panelists. We invite dialogue and will pause halfway through and again at the end to address any questions that come through the Q&A. Our objectives of the discussion today are firstly, to understand the implications of a subtle major change found in the 2020 NEC. Secondly, we want to discuss our interpretations of this change and the impacts of it, both technically and economically. And finally, we will explore a few options and solutions. So Richard, please unmute yourself and let's get into the discussion. Okay, thank you, Sanjeev. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for your interest in our topic today. I know most of the people on the call are veterans of the business, but if there's anybody not familiar with the topic of workspace in a substation building uh, between opposing equipment, it looks something like this. Uh, you can tell this is a stick built building though because it has a concrete floor instead of a steel floor like you normally see in prefabricated substations. The yellow arrow is pointing to an open equipment door which encroaches into the working space and reduces the egress path, which is what we'll be discussing today. The 2020 NEC contains a change found in section 110.26 C2 that's going to have a profound effect on electrical rooms and substation buildings. Table 110.26 A1 was well understood by everybody for many years, and it was simple to use. Uh, but now it's not quite as easy. Now, open equipment doors must be considered as an obstruction for entrance path into and egress from the working space. 
Uh, please note this change only applies to large electrical equipment, 1000 volt nominal or less, 1200 amps and more, and that is longer than six feet. Uh, the intent, no doubt, is to allow people to escape quickly and unimpeded if they need to, and also to allow rescuers to be able to easily access an injured worker in the space if needed. Uh, the major impacts of the new requirement include now new projects using the 2020 NEC will have larger substations and they will be more expensive. Currently, there's no exceptions for supervised industrial locations or special conditions. Uh, this is is this does become a major issue for existing electrical rooms and substations when the equipment is being upgraded and replaced. Now we, we all know it's great to provide enough room for workers to be able to escape safely when there's emergency, uh, but there are currently no provisions for any reasonable exceptions, such as if you have the front of two, two pieces of equipment facing each other and one is not being worked on and the doors to it are closed. Uh, this is where a waiver or special permission from the authority having jurisdiction might be able to be used. Uh, in supervised industrial facilities, there are many places throughout the NEC where requirements are not the same as for residential or commercial installations. And we'll talk more about that. In this example, we show what was legal in the 2017 NEC. This is a plan view of a piece of large electrical equipment. This is a condition number two, where you have exposed live parts on one side and a grounded surface opposing the front of the equipment. The main point here is if the doors to the equipment are open, the entrance and egress from the working space is actually blocked. So if there was a fault or a fire in the in the equipment, then the electrical worker escape path could be blocked by an open door. Now, I want to point out in the first couple of examples today, we're going to be standardizing on large 480 volt equipment that is 36 inches wide, that has 36 inch doors, that open only 90 degrees and the doors are not removable. Um, note that all the equipment links in these examples will be longer than six feet. What we're trying to do is simplify the diagrams because there's an infinite number of pieces of equipment and installations that are available. This is the exact same equipment as the previous slide, but now we have increased spacing. Take a look at the red text at the end of the equipment. Uh, according to the 2020 NEC, we must have a 24 inch minimum entrance and egress path included when the doors to the equipment are open. This makes the substations bigger and it increases the cost of the buildings. Uh, for example, in this installation, the cost increased by $23,000 based on $750 per square foot for the building, just for the extra space in front of the equipment. Now we know this, this entrance and egress path is something reasonable, and it's good to keep workers from being trapped in a workspace if something occurs. Uh, something we will need to think about though, what's gonna happen in existing facilities when equipment is old or damaged and it needs to be replaced? This is really going to have to be worked on a case by case basis. Uh, but as I said, there's no exceptions in the 2020 NEC to allow new equipment to be installed in existing facilities and not comply with the minimum 24 inch entrance and egress out of the working space. I remember when I was a young engineer and I started to go to plants and go to substations. My older and wiser co workers told me. What I need to do is stand in the middle of the aisle and keep my hands in my pockets. What they wanted to do is keep me safe, and they also didn't want me to bump a relay and cause that to trip a feeder. Now you'll see here, 
with this new code requirement, it will be easier to stand in the middle of the aisle and keep your hands in your pockets and stay away from the equipment. All right, in this example, we see a condition three with the front of two equipment facing each other. Uh, there happens to be a six inch square permanent roof support in the entrance and egress path, which is centered perfectly between the two pieces of equipment. Uh, this will not work now, but it may have worked before. Now take a look at the black text here. In the 2017 NEC, a condition three required a minimum of four feet spacing between these equipment with no consideration given to whether the doors of the equipment are open. Now take a look at this red text that's circled. Uh, now we're going to need a minimum of eight feet front to front in a case like this with no obstructions in that 24 inch path. The new language in 110.26 C2 does not say we need a straight path into and out of the workspace. Uh, however, based on the sentence, we could not separate the open doors by 24 inches and put this six inch post in that 24 inch space. That would block the 24 inch access to the working space. From an economic standpoint, if we increase the working space from four feet to eight feet for this 20, 21 foot long piece of equipment at $750 per square, per square foot, we're looking at an increased cost of $63,000 just for more floor space between the equipment, considering nothing else. Here's another version of what we just spoke about on the previous slide but this has been modified to allow a roof support obstruction, and this is acceptable per the 2020 NEC. The, the 2020 NEC doesn't get this detailed, but we, we understand the intent, the intent is clear. And here the roof support is located on one side of the 24 inch entrance and egress path. Uh, so now the minimum dimension front to front between equipment is eight foot six, resulting in a cost increase of $71,000 for the floor space uh, between that equipment. Okay, here's an example of where special permission may be obtained from the authority having jurisdiction. This is a condition number three, similar to what we looked at, looked at before, but in this solution, the AHJ has provided special permission, a waiver, because safe switching procedures are documented and only qualified persons are able to access the equipment. The AHJ would need to invoke NEC section 90.4 and issue a written waiver for this to be acceptable. Uh, where this is allowed, the installation must be shown to be as safe as or safer than what the NEC allows. Now we know most AHJs prefer not to write a waiver as a standard practice. But if somebody was confronted with an existing installation where equipment is being replaced, something like this might be the only reasonable option while still maintaining equivalent safety for the worker. The basis for the special permission in this example is the opposing equipment will have some sort of interlocks or some procedures in place to prohibit the opening of the equipment doors on both sides at the same time. Uh, that way there's still a 24 inch egress path available. All right, a scenario like this wasn't really a concern before the 2020 NEC because we provided spacing between the front of the two equipment based on the applicable condition in table 11026A1. Let's say we have a a scenario like this now. There is nothing in the NEC that says the entrance and egress path has to be in a straight line. We just need to have a minimum of 24 inches to be able to get in and out of the workspace. So then the question is, is this acceptable? Does this meet the intent of the new revision of the NEC? Unfortunately, it's really going to be up to the AHJ to determine whether you need the separation of eight feet 
three feet plus three feet plus two feet between the equipment fronts, or if something like this, if seven foot five, in this case would be acceptable. Uh, this is another possible solution to minimize floor space and meet the words of the NEC without obtaining special permission. Either way, the substation gets bigger, but here the substation would be slightly smaller than with eight feet. Thanks, Richard. So before we move into the second half of the discussion and examine the effects on a complete substation building, let's take a look at the Q&A. So please make sure you send your Q&A in the all panelists so that I can see them. So the first question is related to what constitute an unimpeded path into a workspace. That's for uh, Richard. So has it, hasn't it always been allowed to have an entrance path into and out of a workspace that is not completely straight and parallel with the equipment. So what has changed? Yeah, that is true. There's never been a requirement for having a perfectly straight path into or out of the workspace, either in OSHA or the NEC, and, the, and there still isn't. The NEC doesn't say the path has to be unimpeded by anything but the doors. Uh, the thing is, now we're headed in the direction of not having things block the pathway, uh, not having doors block the pathway in the NEC. And, and it turns out the open doors can cause something else to be the impediment. So really the, the open doors now can cause other issues, such as what we just spoke about with that roof support. Um, before the rule change, the roof support wouldn't have been an issue as long as the doors could open 90 degrees and the working space matched what was required by the code and you had a, a clear path 24 inches wide and about six and a half feet tall in and out of the workspace but now for for this large equipment we have to consider when the doors are open and uh, that's when the equipment is 1000 volts and less over six feet wide, and it's rated 1200 amps or more. Uh, there's also some sort of a requirement there for service equipment, but we really don't get into that much because we're talking about, uh, we're talking about 1000 volt and less. Eddie, did you have anything you wanna to add to that? Thanks Richard. Uh, good morning everybody. And thanks for joining us today. Actually, uh, I think you covered it pretty well, but for those of you on the call, if something was not clear in Richard's explanation, uh, certainly please use the Q&A to type in your question. And we are gonna answer all questions uh, if we don't get them to them today during the call, because it is, uh, we have a rather large audience and uh, our time is limited, but we will certainly address all of your questions, even if it's after the presentation via email. So let me take another one. Were there any recent accidents or incidents which formed the basis for NEC's new requirement rating that means greater than 1200 amp and greater than six feet long? Eddie, you want to take that one? You know, that that's, um, I knew that was going to come up and actually that's part of the reason why we're doing this presentation today because what happened, this rule change did not actually go through the normal NFPA required process. What happened was there was a similar uh, public input that was made and then our, the code panel one uh, revised it and during the time between the public input stage and the public comment stage and therefore it did not go undergo the, the type of review or the full review process that normally would happen. So um, there's a little bit strange here. Uh, and one thing I wanna say is I'm not knocking the NFPA process or code panel one because having been part of that process for many years, it is um, it is the best that I know of out of all the committees that I serve on. And uh, things like this unfortunately happen. So we don't know uh, no present, no substantiation was presented uh, for this change that I know of, other than for, you know, it's, it's common sense, I guess, that you would want 
the worker to be able to escape out of a path if you were having an arc flash or some other type of incident where you had to get away quickly. So we, we have, I have researched it. I have talked to code panel member, uh, code panel one members, and I don't believe there was any specific incidents that caused this change. Richard, did I cover that? I think so, Eddie. But again, folks, if uh, if that did not cover, you know, any concerns or maybe it raised others, please uh, feel free to ask uh, more details on the Q and A. All right, I think we'll, we will address a little bit more of the questions on the back end. So I would say. Uh, Eddie, good discussion, but let's take a look at the entire substation building. Okay, before we get into this, um, I see on the Q&A that someone's having trouble hearing. I hope that's not everybody on the call is having that issue, but you may want to check if you're using a headset, if you maybe you've muted yourself or something like that. Okay, I'm seeing the other folks are not having a problem, so good. All right, let's get into this slide. So thanks, Sanjeev. And um, this diagram here is actually going to represent a pre-manufactured substation plan view like we would normally see in an um, industrial environment, a petrochem plant. And Richard previously in the, in the examples showed uh, details as far as, you know, the the length of the equipment and the, the size of the doors and stuff. But this is going to be real world example. So this one that we're looking at right here is designed in accordance with the 2017 NEC and the minimum spacing requirements prior to this change. The main items that I want to point out in this slide are the equipment that is involved in this substation, along with the overall dimensions that are going to be shown by bubbles one through four. As you can see by the different colors that are gray and blue, we're going to have six modules or building sections with the maximum dimension based on the maximum allowable shipping size over most roadways in the United States. Each of these sections are approximately 14 feet by 55 foot, and the shipping splits are indicated by the dashed lines. Uh, also, please note the legend uh, down at the bottom right hand of the screen. This is going to show up on every one of the slides that we're going to cover here. All of the yellow equipment is going to be 480 volts or less. The orange colored equipment will be 4,160 volts, which is 2,400 volts to ground. And then the green equipment is going to be 13,800 volts, measuring 8 kV to ground. In section one on the upper left, the equipment is going to be a lineup of 480 volt switch gear and 480 volt motor control centers. Just below that in section two, we're going to have two rows of 480 volt silicon controlled rectifiers or SCR cabinets. And below that in section number three, we're going to have a lineup of 4160 switch gear and motor control centers. Moving to the right into section six, we're going to have a lineup of 13.8 kV switch gear. And then just above that in section five, we have more 480 volt motor control centers and then a battery rack up there in section four. As you can see here, the overall dimensions are 105 feet by 41 feet right now. But of these four dimensions that are shown, uh, especially take a look at bubble number four over there on the right hand side that right now is 40 foot seven inches. From an economic standpoint, based on this 4,241 square foot building at what we're saying is a, a fairly common number around $750 per square foot, we'd be looking at approximately $3.2 million for this building. Um, then again, th again, this is based on the NEC prior to the 2020 edition. On this slide, uh, it shows the exact same substation that now meets the new change in that we found in the 2020 NEC. On the next six slides, I'm going to zoom into each section and we're going to take a closer look at the delta and dimensions 
from the minimum working space dimensions between the 2017 and what is required now by the 2020 revision. The equipment is identical. We, we've not added or taken away anything. And in the, they're in the same positions right now that we just saw on the previous slide. But one of the first things that becomes pretty obvious is the growth in the dimensions shown near bubble four to the far right, which is now 44 foot four inches, whereas before it was only 40 foot seven inches. Dimensions one, two, and three remain the same for this example. From a cost standpoint, we added 392 square feet. So the delta is going to be an increase between the footage based on the 2017 NEC and the 2020 NEC is approximately $300,000 or roughly 10%. Now this co the cost for this building is going to be $3.5 million instead of the 3.2. Here in section one, we see two increases in the required workspaces. The dimension near bubble C on the upper right of the slide was, was three foot six inches, and now it is gonna to increase to three foot nine inches due to the new requirement. Just below that, um, the dimension near bubble D grew from four foot to five foot one inch minimum between the rear of the 480 volt switch gear with it, we're gonna assume has accessible live parts and the 480 volt motor control centers. We pointed out earlier the parameters for this new rule that it's uh, 1200 amps or more and 1000 volts and less and over six feet in length, then it applies. So if this MCC with a 1200 amp rating we see here were to be less than 1200 amps, let's say 800 amps, and the switch gear uh, was less than the large equipment parameters, then this new rule would not apply. You would simply just need to comply with the existing table 110.26 per A. And that may be one possible solution in your future designs uh, to save a few inches, where especially where space is limited and you can live with a rating of less than 1200 amps in this example. On section two, we have a condition two where you're, um, you have an exposed live parts on one side and you have a grounded surface on the opposing side at bubble H. Since the motor control center door is only 16 inches and the opposing equipment here is a grounded surface on the back side of these SCR cabinets, then we've complied with a new sentence in the 2020 NEC already with a distance of uh, three foot six inches from table 110, 26, print A, print one. As you can see, the dimensions here, uh, two foot two near bubble G uh, meets the required 24 inch min minimum clearance for the entrance into and out of uh, the workspace with the doors of the MCC open. Now let's look at the uh, dimensions near bubble F and J. Near bubble J, the 2017 NEC only required three foot six inches of clearance between the front of the SCR cabinets and the rear of the cabinets that are in the building section right below it. So in fact, since these SCR cabinets are individual pieces of equipment and they're less than 1200 amps each, um, in our opinion, this new, the new sentence that was added, this new requirement would not apply here. Uh, because it's it's not a 1200 amp rated piece of equipment, even though we have several 400 amp pieces of equipment butted up end to end and it's over six feet. So here, technically, the uh, three foot six inch minimum is all you still need to comply with the code. But this is one of those areas where you're, we're here gonna err on the conservative side like most engineers do and consider the intent of the, this new rule change. And we're gonna leave two foot of clearance between the open door edge when it's at 90 degrees to the equipment and the back of the next row of cabinets shown near bubble F. This makes the minimum dimension near bubble J five feet instead of three foot six inches. So we've added 18 inches here. Now, Here's where things start getting a little stickier. 
strictly looking at it from a code perspective. Prior to the 2020 NEC, all that was required for the minimum distance shown near bubble M between the 480 volt SCR cabinets and the 4160 medium voltage gear was five feet based on table 110.34 print A for a condition three where you're exposed live parts to exposed live parts where the equipment with the higher voltage to ground was 2400 volts. But 11032 also requires that the doors of the equipment must be able to open 90 degrees. So normally we would have probably made the minimum dimension near bubble M a dimension of six foot anyway to allow the doors on both sides to open a full 90 degrees. Again, since uh, these 480 volt SCRs cabinets are only rated 400 amps each and they're individual cabinets, in my opinion, we still only require six foot uh, minimum. What that would mean, of course, is you may not be complying with the intent of the new rule for the large voltage equipment. We don't know. Uh, we do know, using common sense, that the intent was that we we want to be able to escape personnel to escape, or also we also want to be able to get uh, rescue personnel in if there were an incident. But we don't know exactly all of the substantiation because um, it's not documented. As I mentioned earlier, it didn't go through the the full process like it normally would have. So for the perfect, um, the thing is here though, in this, when you have a situation like this, the authority having jurisdiction is gonna to have to make this determination for you. For the purposes of our example today, however, we're gonna err on, on the conservative side and we're gonna assume we're only gonna need two foot minimum clear when the doors of the equipment are open 90 degrees, which separates the SCR cabinets and the medium voltage equipment by eight feet front to front as seen near bubble L. This possibly creates another issue for us, even though it's not electrical. Uh, bubble K off to the left-hand side indicates nearly 18 feet now for section three. Depending on where this uh, building section is gonna be shipped, if it's in the within the United States over roadways, it may be too large to put on a truck. That would mean that we'd possibly have to rearrange the location of the shipping splits or add more of them. Uh, possibly another thing we could do is rearrange the entire substation so the shipping splits land in the correct location. Adding more shipping splits, of course, not only increases the cost for reassembly in the field and shipping, but it also creates the unwanted possibility of more errors when reassembling and reconnecting all the modules in the field. And um, the errors I'm speaking of here mainly are the miswiring or, or misconnection of when you're doing the cross module uh, wiring across the shipping splits. Here in section four, it's gonna remain unchanged other than what occurred in section one off over there to the left that we looked at a while ago where we added the three inches. Uh, to comply with the 2020 NEC. Section five is gonna grow by eight inches on each of the two workspaces for a total increase of 16 inches shown near bubbles S is in Sam and V is in Victor. We, we grow from four foot previously to now needing four foot eight inches for each front to front distance based on a 20 inch wide vertical section of motor control center with a 16 inch door. Uh, this is another one of those scenarios we spoke about earlier about the equipment rating and the dimensions that may, you may be able to take advantage of. If, if you have an MCC lineup here that is less than 1200 amps and less than six feet long, then this new rule won't apply and you can go back to the four foot minimum from table 110.26A1. Remember, section six is just to the right of section three that we looked at. And section three was what drove the 17 foot 11 dimension shown near bubble Y. So for this uh, shipping split, it'll be the same. However, we must remember uh, what was mentioned earlier also about the possible intermediate roof supports of every one of these minimum clearances we've been looking at. 
entering into and out of these workspaces. The building fabricator is going to need to pay a lot closer attention to the location of these supports and be aware of the restrictions that may happen once the equipment is put in. And then where you, in cases where you have the house builder or you know the, the builder the building fabricator and the building integrator that actually places the equipment and does all the wiring, where they're two separate piece, uh, companies, then there will be, need to be a lot more coordination between the placement of the roof supports and the equipment. So we're getting closer to the end. We're not quite there yet, but to summarize uh, the workspaces about uh, electrical equipment, we must have access into and out of these spaces. And this in itself is not new, of course. For all equipment voltages, the minimum dimensions of this pathway is 24 inches wide by six and a half feet high. And like Richard was saying a while ago, the path uh, does not necessarily need to be in a straight line perpendicular or um, in parallel with the equipment. It can have zigs and zags in the pathway uh, strictly looking at it from a code perspective. Is that a good design practice? I don't know. That's up to the uh, the owner and the, the engineer that are that's designing it. But now you're going to need uh, to ma maintain that 24 inch minimum width of this pathway with the equipment doors open only again where the equipment is rated less than a thousand volts greater than 1200 amps and over six feet in width. The 2020 NEC right now, as we speak, does not contain this same new provision for the 24 inch path with the doors open where the equipment is all greater than a thousand volts. The reason that I'm saying as of right now today is because there may be a tentative interim amendment or a TIA that could be written in the next uh, two to three years before the next cycle comes out. And if it's accepted by the NFPA Standards Council, uh, then it will be part of the code. And um, that is going to be possible if they determine that this rule was inadvertently left out of medium voltage installations and should have really been applied there. But since uh, large equipment greater than 1,000 volts has control compartments with low voltage, does this mean we automatically have to assume that we're back to the new rule in 110.26 paren C2? I personally don't believe that was the intent, but that is my opinion and it's really gonna be up to the proper authority having jurisdiction to determine these types of uh, issues. So the intent obviously that we've been talking about today of this change was, was good, I, I love it. Uh, especially if I were out there still carrying tools, I, I want all the room I can get. And as we all know, safety is priority number one, not only here at Fleur, but all companies. We, we want to keep our folks safe. The result of this change, however, will, will it will require more real estate for new substation buildings and electrical rooms where you have large low voltage equipment. Uh, I've looked at several different scenarios and it can range, the increase can range anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20% larger due to this rule. Um, large medium voltage equipment isn't currently required by the 2020 NEC, like we said, to comply with the doors open rules. But even without a TIA, the authority having jurisdiction may interpret it that way. So be careful, ask a lot of questions uh, before you start building the building. So will your building integrator apply this new rule to medium voltage and high voltage installations also? They may, they may interpret this rule differently and apply it across the entire project. Here in Texas, we have a lot of house builders um, and substation builders, and they will have to comply with the 2020 NEC as of September 1st this year is when the state of Texas adopts the 2020 National Electric Code. Since there are usually multiple entities, uh, you can have the, the client being one 
the owner operator being one of the authorities having jurisdiction. You can have a local municipal or state local authority having jurisdiction. And then of course we have OSHA at the top uh, at a federal level that can be uh, an authority having jurisdiction. So with all these different multiple entities, are all these AHJs gonna interpret this change consistently? Well, probably not. Uh, but having said that, just because an owner AHJ may be okay with something, let's say a special permission uh, or a waiver, that doesn't necessarily mean that your local fire marshal or federal authority is gonna be okay with it either. It's probably only a matter of time, in my opinion, before this shows, this rule is gonna show up in our uh, code of federal regulations, such as 29 CFR part 1910 and 1926. So take a closer look at any project um, that you may have on the drawing board and any existing revamps where the 2020 NEC is gonna be applicable. And I guess one last thing that I wanna leave you with, I have submitted uh, public inputs for um, a revision to this section that may or may not get accepted. And what it's gonna, what I'm asking for is uh, an exception for supervised industrial locations. But I want to encourage every one of you on this call this morning to do the same. Um, to work well, the, the, the codes and standard system, whether it be the National Electric Code or IEEE or any standard, depends on input from every one of us in this business. So I wanna thank you all really again for, for your time this morning and I'm gonna hand it back to you, Sanjeev. Thank you, Eddie. So I'm gonna go through the Q&A. So we'll try to address as many as we can within the time we have. Uh, so let's start with the uh, first question to you, Eddie. So what happens if I have an existing large piece of equipment replaced and the local AIG accepts replacing it in kind, would I still have a problem with OSHA? Um, prob you could or you, could, you may not. And that's a really tough one to answer because there's for several reasons. Uh, OSHA doesn't, of course, usually get involved in, in matters like this unless there has been an incident. In the uh, US, OSHA, of course, has jurisdiction for worker safety in, never, in nearly every facility, building, um, work site that is uh, privately or publicly owned and has employees. Now, some states have their own OSHA, such as uh, Alaska, I know ACOSH, uh, they have it up there, but it's essentially OSHA with um, additional requirements. And also some branches of the federal government, such as the military itself is not included within OSHA's purview. Um, yes, the local authority jur having jurisdictions can approve an, an installation, but if there is an incident and OSHA is called out and enters the picture, the owner of the facility can uh, still be fined if OSHA finds there's to be negligence in worker safety by the employer. Uh, forever incident, there's of course different circumstances. So it's really not clear cut where, what the liabilities would be for the owner or the engineer, uh, responsible engineer. As engineers, uh, inspectors, electricians, and designers, we need to do of course everything we can do to keep people safe and um, therefore hopefully keeping the government, whether it be federal or state level, and any lawyers out of the picture, uh, because that usually doesn't end well. The best approach with this rule is the same for any other though. Always use good engineering judgment, follow the letter of the code. If you, I mean, that that's priority. Yeah, you have to follow the letter of the code and where you can't, and sometimes there are instances where you just cannot follow the code, make certain you have met or exceeded the intent of the code and have a written waiver, which is special permission provided by the authority having jurisdiction and keep that permanently 
for an owner operator, make sure you keep that permanently in your records. Uh, also, if it were the uh, engineering company, an EPC firm, makes and you've provided uh, or obtained the waiver, make sure you keep that in your records for ever, uh, basically. Good point, Eddie. So, uh, Richard, maybe you can take the next one. So, will the 90 degree door position be a fixed rule? Or could a door swing 120 degrees or greater be allowed to help reduce the total distance between the equipment fronts? Okay, uh, that's a good question. I don't really know that there's any anything written into the NEC about it. I think it, you know it's quite possible if the door could open more than 90 degrees, or maybe even if the door was removable. Uh, then that might uh, eliminate the extra spacing that we've been talking about today. You know, of course, it's not really practical to have doors that are removable, especially on switch gear. Uh, but, but I think it could be practical to have doors that open more than 90 degrees. Uh, the thing is, you know, even if that door opened 120 degrees, it probably still would not give you an additional 24 inches. So probably still would end up impacting the size of the building, at least somewhat. Eddie, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, actually that has been discussed. We've been talking a lot with uh, suppliers and vendors of these buildings. I've also been uh, speaking to owner operator engineering uh, personnel and then I've also been talking with our state inspectors and a little bit about it and you know the the way the that simple sentence that they added in there is um, written that the of course the equipment doors have always had to open at least 90 degrees but if you do have a door that can open 120 to 180 degrees then that would be perfectly acceptable um, to have that, but like you said, um, a lot of these doors on this large equipment is going to have a tough time opening up more than about 120 degrees because a lot of times you'll have like uh, protection relays mounted on the front of the door that would bump into the adjacent section uh, right next to it. So, uh, and then of course you've got har wiring harnesses that usually come off that come out of the end. Uh, motor control center switch gear onto the the door, the equipment on the door, such as the relays. So removing the door is not really, to me, a, a good answer. But I, I can assure you that the major manufacturers that uh, these pieces of equipment, they are looking at it hard, uh, not only the integrators, but also the manufacturers themselves of the switch gear to see what they can do to make things a little bit more uh, friendly as far as not having to eat up so much floor space and still meet the, the new rule. Thanks, Eddie. I think this is where we're going to have all our engineers have to put their creative and innovative hat on to come uh, with a new design that will still provide the safety for, for our operators, but we can still you know, try to optimize costs. So there's another one here. So maybe Eddie, you can take this one. So how does this apply for ongoing projects that are already in construction? I, I've seen that um, several people ask that on the, the question and answer session here. And that that is very, very, very important to realize that uh, where that line in the sand is where you've got to comply with this new rule. If If something were designed prior to the 27, uh, 2020 change, then in my opinion, um, you know, the, it depend, I guess it depends on the authority having jurisdiction, but most authorities having jurisdictions that I've worked with across the United States and internationally won't make you uh, retro, you know, apply retroactively the new rules to an existing design because it would that that would be a nightmare if you had to start increasing in equipment sizes and buildings that already been built and stuff but um, at the same time 
if like the the integrators and house builders we have here in in the state of texas they're going to have to comply with the 2020 code because the texas department of licensing and regulation uh, actually has purview over those buildings and they actually perform inspections on those buildings so to make sure they comply with the nec even though they may be uh, leaving the state of Texas or even the United States for another country. Because they're, they're built here in Texas, they're going to have to comply with the 2020 NEC as of September 1 this year. Now, um, some states are probably on the 2011 and 2014 codes, or maybe even earlier than that. And the same thing applies there. If it's built in the state, they it's usually um, built to what what is enforceable in that state. But that that doesn't mean that it's going to be accepted into another state. So it, it's really going to get sticky as far as how this is applied, especially for ongoing jobs. But the uh, if we had to. I guess summarize it in a short um, sentence is that if if it's built, I would you know you may want to take a look at it and see if there's anything you do you can do. Probably not, um, but most likely nobody's going to make you uh, upsize it to comply with these new requirements. But of course, I don't know that that that's going to be 100% in all cases. And, you know, if you have something on the drawing board right now that's not, uh, has not been built and is not going to be even fabricated until 2021, then, of course, yeah, you're probably going to be in that, even though your specs may say that you're designing to 2017, the building integrator is going to be uh, obligated to comply with the 2020 code if he's here in Texas for sure. Wow. So, so maybe there's uh, another one. Maybe Richard, you can uh, jump in here. So, did the NEC committee not consider potential impacts to industry, especially the condition where new equipment is installed into an existing building? Is there consideration allowance for a transition to the new rule? I'm not. I'm not really sure exactly what was considered. Uh, when this was created, there's not a good record of, of why or how this came about, you know, what the reasons for it are, like we had mentioned before. Uh, what was the other part of the question, Sanjeev? Seemed like there was two questions. Yeah, so the thing was there, was there any consideration or allowance for a transition to the new rule? Oh, okay. So, yeah, the consideration or allowance to the transition, well, you know, different areas of the country incorporate the 2020 NEC at different points in time. So once the 2020 NEC is, is adopted in that area, then the 2020 NEC has to be followed. Uh, Eddie, could you add anything to this answer? Yeah, the um, there is a, I think probably what the questioner, uh, the person asking the question is, is alluding to is in 110.26a, there is actually um, a little bit of relief in there for existing installations that may not comply with table 110.26a. And there is nothing like that right now in this new sentence in 110.26c2 that would uh, allow any relief from this rule for existing installations where you're doing retrofits. And uh, that's another one of the proposals that I'm going to put in to see if we can't get some sort of relief because I think it would be, un, you know, why it's, yeah, it's great to have uh, extra room and we want people to be safe. At the same time, are you really going to, let's say if you're in a large uh, commercial building, not just petrochem, but let's say you're in a large com uh, commercial building where you have an existing electrical room. Are you really going to be expected to knock out walls and, and make the room larger? 
I, I just can't see that as being uh, reasonable or enforced, I, but I don't know. There's a lot of questions remaining uh, to be seen how people are going to deal with this new change. So we're getting close to the top of the hour. I still have a lot of questions, um, but I will try to squeeze in one last one, and we will try to answer uh, all the questions in the Q and A. All right, uh, uh, with a follow up. So the the last question that I can squeeze in, uh, maybe. Um, Eddie, you can take that also. So have you considered submitting a TIA to remove this requirement? When read literally, the very existing of a door, regardless of the size of the room, impedes access or egress. Yes, I actually have gone down that path, and I, um, I'm i not able to get the, – the with, the with the TIA process, you have to get, uh, for those of you that are not – familiar with it, you have to get somebody from Code Panel 1 and somebody from the Technical Correlating Committee to sponsor the TIA. In other words, it's not like a public input where I can just send in a, a request for a TIA to get relief. Um, so, so far I have not had any real interest from Code Panel 1 or the Technical Correlating Committee to sponsor a TIA. All right, so we really reached to the top of the hour. So I want to say thank you, Eddie and Richard, for your great insight on this topic. And uh, we're going to uh, be hosting a number of these webinars going forward. So our next one is uh, scheduled to be uh, on, on July 21st. So that's in two weeks' time. And, um, the topic will be the value of thermodynamics for safe and trouble-free process operation. So in this webinar, our Fluor Senior Fellow, Paul Matas, will talk about real-world examples showing the value of thermodynamics in enabling a safe and trouble-free process operation. So keep in touch with your Fluor contacts. Visit the Innovation Builders page on Fluor.com or follow our social media postings so that we can alert you or invite you to the future webinars. So I would say thanks again for all of you guys dialing in today. So Eddie and Richard will be happy to assist you if you have any questions on the reasons behind this uh, change and uh, can offer you insight into the code panel actions. Please feel free to email them at innovation.builders at flow.com. Have a safe day and we'll look forward to host you again in our next webinar. Thank you.